Uh, to get us going, I want to share a little bit about some of the work that I did when, as the Associate Director in the Office of Strategic Partnerships. I had the wonderful privilege and pleasure of uh, driving a White House initiative focused largely on the President's memorandum to expand national service opportunities for Americans. So uh, in, in the summer of 2013, the President uh, and the White House staff really looked at how the administration could drive some initiatives to make more opportunities available, like Peace Corps service, like the expansion of AmeriCorps service. And so as a result, uh, one of the outputs of that program was uh, the Employers of Service program, which Glenn mentioned earlier, and we're happy to, to know that uh, uh, MPCA is a named partner to that effort. Uh, but this effort really sought to identify organizations, nonprofits, uh, universities, uh, and very specifically corporations that would do one of several things to help hire uh, young Americans and Americans who have served in Peace Corps or AmeriCorps service, which is really important. And so now, this brings us to the very discussion point of this, of this panel, which is to talk about how um, all of uh, your service in Peace Corps have helped you to decide that a career in corporate America um, would be appropriate. So I'm going to now turn it over to the panelists and give each of the three minutes to talk a little bit about what they do today, and then we'll get into some questions. You are starting, Rosie. Hi, and thanks again. This is awesome. It's really <laughs> wonderful to be here. I, I didn't get into law right away. I actually, for the first 12 years of, of the Peace Corps, I did very, um, more of like things that you would imagine would follow from the work I did in the Peace Corps. I, I stayed in education. I was doing some education in the Peace Corps as well as community development. And I taught in mainland China and rural Alaska. And I wanted to live in every major biome and ecosystem on the planet and like understand how people and culture relate to environment. It was just so exciting for me to learn about other cultures. And I was fortunate enough to have these opportunities to work in an Eskimo village and, and then off in mainland China. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Right. So, yeah, so after teaching in rural Alaska and mainland China, I went to Stanford Law School, which doesn't logically follow necessarily. And I was a single mom at the time with a three year old. So that really didn't follow. And, and people would, would be interested in why I got there. And I said, well, I, I, you know, I, I kind of like cross cultural experiences. And coming to Stanford, this is really a cross-cultural experience. <laughs> and, you know, actually, I've been in, I was in Sierra Leone shortly before their Civil War. I was in um, mainland China shortly after the Cultural Revolution. But frankly, my biggest culture shock is here at Stanford Law School. And I, so yeah, I was well-trained for the, the culture shock at Stanford. I had to treat it like another culture. But um, so when, the reason I went there was because I wanted to do international development. But being a single mom, I really couldn't quite see myself taking my child away from like the other parent and living it over abroad. Um, and eventually, being in Silicon Valley at Stanford, I started getting exposed to a lot of the work that Chloe does and, what, and also what Megan does. I mean, things that were happening here and I realized that development, whether it's in Sierra Leone and you're talking about, you know, a village's first pump well. Like, after you've lived in the bush for a while, you realize, pump, that is like a highly sophisticated piece of machinery. I mean, they have to mine the iron over there. And who thought of that anyway? You, know, you start realizing sophistication is simple things. Whether you're talking about that kind of development or whether you're talking about you know, the latest in medical device products. You know, um, new technologies for removing cancer tissue from breasts or whatever, you know, I mean, the, it's development, development's development. And any, any place on the spectrum, you know, of human life. And so the process is pretty similar. You have to raise money, you have to raise awareness, you have to get community buy-in. Yeah, um, there's so much that's the same. So I actually found that the Peace Corps was the best training possible for Silicon Valley 
and especially representing high tech companies, entrepreneurs, and um, dealing with venture capital, which the, the process is really quite similar. Thanks. Okay. Uh, first of all, how many other uh, RPCBs from Niger are out there? Raise your hands. Okay, three, four. Um, so I returned, actually first I wanted to uh, take a moment to thank Congressman Farr. That was such an inspiring uh, conversation and I was just looking at more information about you and I'm not surprised you were born on the 4th of July. You're clearly a gift to our nation. So again, thank you for inspiring me again. Um, so I returned from the Peace Corps feeling a little bit cynical about development work and for a moment went to be a lawyer. Then went back to graduate school thinking, ah, not so much lawyer, I think actually I am interested in international development. And got what I thought was my dream job at the World Bank. It was working in the private sector development department in uh, microfinance. And this was before microfinance was a household name. And after about a year, realized my dream job was actually my nightmare job and quit and moved to um, Silicon Valley um, back when it was easier to get a job at West Pine Apartment, which might be the case again now. Um, and uh, literally started working as a secretary for an internet startup that I was really excited about. They were selling, they were using Twitter flyer miles, click miles, to incent people to buy things online. And I convinced them that we could actually use click miles to get people to donate online. And it worked, it worked really well, because people will do anything for frequent flyer miles, back then anyway. Um, so then, then I, you know, in the early 2000s, I had this really unique combination of internet technology, nonprofit, philanthropy experience, and Yahoo found me. Um, I went to Yahoo, and as I like to say, I overstayed my welcome. I was there almost 10 years. Um, but while I was there, I, I was actually started working literally two weeks before 9-11. This is also back when the internet seemed to be falling apart. Um, and uh, what we, we did something smart during 9-11, which is we put Donate Now buttons on the front page of Yahoo. Um, and this is what I realized, that Yahoo was about to lay off thousands of people, but we were able to leverage our core asset, our probably the most unique asset then and still is now, the front page of Yahoo, is a way to help connect people who want to do something, something with a way to do something that was to donate. And for many people, it's the first time he's ever donated online. So I ended up following Jeff Weiner, who's the CEO of, of LinkedIn, to uh, LinkedIn, and I've been there about five years. And um, I mean, I'll get to this later, but there's no question that Peace Corps um, has made me successful. It, it's probably the attributes that I developed in Peace Corps are certainly the attributes that made me successful in each of my my jobs, and it has opened up every door along the way. And I just could not be a more Stronger advocate for uh, Peace Corps. I'm afraid you, you steal the thunder yeah. from these great questions that I worked on all night. <laughs> <laughs> for, uh, thanks very much. So I think my, my interest in finance uh, and the connection with the Peace Corps was always quite logical to me, although I do admittedly get a lot of funny looks when I tell people I'm a banker now. And, I started my career uh, in the Peace Corps in Thailand, but, but to me that pathway was very logical. As a matter of fact, when I applied to the Peace Corps, I graduated from college in 1990. Uh, it was a pretty difficult time uh, from an economic situation, and for, for someone with an English degree in a small liberal arts school in the middle of Illinois the, to come wanting to work on Wall Street, um, there weren't a lot of opportunities for that. And I always had a real passion in travel and a real passion uh, and seeing the world, and frankly, helping trying to do good in the world, and the Peace Corps seemed like a very logical step. And they had just announced small business development programs in Eastern Europe, and I thought, what better way uh, to go get that experience uh, in the face of a difficult economic environment? Uh, and quite logically, I'll say, the Peace Corps looked at my application, the, the recruiter in Chicago, and said, "You're 22 years old. You have no business experience. <laughs> you took French." in college and you have an English major, uh, we're going to send you to West Africa and teach English, of course. Uh, and, and, and I was a little shocked taking it back, uh, but um, uh, it turned out that the next program that I qualified for uh, was actually in Thailand to do that, just that, to teach English uh, in Thailand. And I, I reluctantly took the opportunity because I didn't know anything about Asia. Uh, and, and I can tell you, without a doubt, apart from the fact that I met my wife and, and, and uh, that's obviously been a very positive, important part of my life. But the experience there uh, trained me in ways that are 
valuable every single day. So I echo what Meg said, that the, the, the ability to deal with adversity, the ability to try and sell people on ideas that they might not necessarily believe in, uh, the ability to have conviction in what you believe in or what you're trying to, to get across, uh, and to be able to navigate bureaucracy, uh, the ability to, to frankly reflect on, on success when it may not be obvious at the moment in time when it happens, and, and have the patience and the conviction to, kind of to, to reflect on that and, and learn from that and be in confidence from that, all of which are traits that I use honestly every day in my, in my job as a banker. And so for me, that, it's always funny for me to get that funny look when people try to make that connection between Peace Corps and banking. But I can tell you, my career, uh, which has been an amazing, very fun career in banking, would not have been the same had I not been through those two and a half years in the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. accomplished individuals here with a great, great career uh, paths, uh, but also um, rooted in the, in the start of their careers with service in the Peace Corps. So, uh, Kelly, you answered a, a couple of the questions in your opening, uh, but so I will go to the other panelists and, and ask them to talk very specifically about uh, or answer the question, how has your Peace Corps experience prepared you for the work that you do today? Well, Rose, I want you to start. Okay, well, I, I think this panel is more about corporate connection, although right now I, I think people would like to hear that after practicing as a corporate lawyer in Silicon Valley and um, you know, working with venture capitalists and, and entrepreneurs, I went back to Sierra Leone for the first time in 2011 because of Friends for Salon, which you know, is, is an um, NPCA inspired group. And it was having its annual meeting in Freetown. So I went back, and at that point in time, I had found, I had co founded Virtual Law Partners with VLP Law, as it's now called. And, um, you know, we had scaled that law firm up to 40 attorneys in one year, and we were going international and doing cross border deals. We had a lot of things lined up. But when I went back to Sierra Leone, I was so moved by my experience of reconnecting with the people that I had known. 35 years ago, I mean, little kids were now adults. One little kid was the chief of the village, you know, and, uh, and this family I was very close to um, were there. I had worried about them a lot during the war. Anyway, so I came home and I resigned from my corporate law position. So that when Jimmy Carter became president, I was the only one of my generation with international experience, and which was a huge asset. Yeah. Uh, to my going on for different kinds of service. I think that we have to find a way to get the young people of color, and I know that it, is how it has always been an issue, but we have to not give up on that issue. The young men and women and the young color uh, groups in our society have to have the same experience and they will bring the same level of contributions to our society as we all have done. And I appreciate having the opportunity to meet you and talk about this when we were in Atlanta, Glenn and I, a couple of years ago. And so I know that you live those values and, and, and you should find comfort that I know that uh, Carrie Hessler Radlin uh, is doing uh, a lot on this issue, um, largely because she cares about it, uh, but also because there are a group of people like me and others in the building uh, that have uh, been really localizing this. It, it, it means a lot to the, the staff that are, are minority in the building who, are, who serve themselves, and uh, you'd be happy to know that they've organized really well around this issue, put forward uh, several things that, uh, that they'd like to see the agency do and they're, they're ready to, to roll up their sleeves and get some of this work done. So, And I think the numbers are up in terms of applicant numbers, so uh, I think the agency's headed in the right direction. Um, we are well and truly pushed into the lunch time frame, but I know that there's some people that really want to ask questions. We've got one back here. Can we take one more question? Yes. yes one more? Okay. One, one more back question. here. I've been whistling that, so. <laughs> Okay, uh, my name is Wes Kobiyama. I've been in the Peace Corps three times. <laughs> <laughs> I, felt, uh, I was in 
uh, Tanzania in 65. So I'm coming out out of the 60s, and I really appreciate the new paradigm of you going into your corporation. But I wonder, because myself, I would have never gone into corporations. I want to know if you had a philosophical shift in your thinking uh, when you did that. Can I answer that? And, and I want to just one more question. <laughs> because coming out of the 60s, I know many of my colleagues would never have gone into the corporation. The other thing is I, I support deputy mayors. We do need more people of color. And when I wanted to go to Asia, they sent me to Africa. <laughs> but that was the greatest experience I had. And then I've been in Western Samoa and the Solomon Islands. Wonderful places. Thank you. We're actually really happy to have the Peace Corps. So, as I mentioned this earlier, um, now the Peace Corps has implemented reforms that allow uh, volunteers to choose, uh, even against the Peace Corps' fears at the time that uh, some of the perhaps more unattractive places would. Uh, uh, would not get uh, volunteers to serve. The, the, the numbers actually are showing bearing out differently. Um, you're getting uh, quite a number of the volunteers to, that will make a choice, but but they also select, I'll go anywhere, do anything. So. Yeah. Take that question. I totally want to answer that question. <laughs> I can't even tell you how much psychological and emotional angst <laughs> I went through on this. And, uh, because not only was I in the Peace Corps, but I mean, for 12 years after that, I was, you know, working in other countries and still doing very Peace Corps-esque types of things. And I was left of left and just hated the whole corporate world. And in my mind and in my heart, had, you know, dehumanized the corporate world and villainized it. Um, and I have to say, this is a long story. We can talk about it off, you know, line, so I don't take up too much time here. But I, and since we're talking about people of color, like one of my two best friends in law school were um, African Caribbean Americans, and my one friend is from Jamaica and had grown up in Jamaica, came here at the end of high school. He was the one who helped me make the shift. He he just was like, he was just so clear about it. He was going into corporate law. He had no compunction. And he was like, bro, think, of, think it through, you know? Like, what, are the people who really care about society going to be just fighting for, like, you know, these few jobs that are available in nonprofit law? Like, think it through. You can, you, you know, they need people like us doing corporate law. And, and just think you can, he gave me all these reasons, including you'll make more money, you'll be able to do more with that money to help people get on the lifeboat. He had this theory about helping people you know, even individuals that you help getting on the life raft. He's like, and you can bring your philosophy. I brought five African American associates into Wilson Sonsini Bridge in Rosati. I tripled the number of African American associates at that law firm. <laughs> it was only five, right? You know, but it was why? Because I had a lot of black friends, right? Because I hung out with like, because I went to Africa. I grew up in an all white community. But I got to know black people, and all of a sudden I was comfortable with them. And then when I went to law school, they were like, I just ended up having these good friends who just happened. One time, uh, Mario Rosati, who's a name partner, said, Roseanne, I have the most diverse group in the firm now because of you. And I said, I have a few white friends too. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, then the firm was bragging about how many, you know, how they had such a diverse firm and all these minorities, you know. So there is something to be said about bringing your sensitivities to the corporate level. Yeah, thank you for that. The only thing I would add is, is something that is really different from this generation than my generation or your generation is the lines between the sectors are much, much more blurry. In fact, um, I was having this conversation with a colleague, a millennial, she's 25, and I was saying, so when you got out of college, like how did you decide between government, nonprofit, and for profit? They don't think like that. They think they want to do X, and they could do X at a government agency, they could do it at a nonprofit, a, a corporation. Um, this idea of, of and even the notion of a tri sector athlete, there's now research uh, stuff written on the value of, of hiring a tri sector athlete. Um, so I think this idea of, of these silos doesn't exist the way it did when I graduated from college, and probably you know, before, before that. There's just extraordinary ways you can make an impact regardless of your sector. 
I agree, and on clo a closing remark, I'll take uh, moderator's privilege here. Uh, I'll just say that I think that the, the, the corporations need the consciousness of Black Peace Corps volunteers to help them challenge them to be the, their, their better selves, to help challenge them to, to diversity, to challenge them to be good corporate social responsible uh, citizens of the world. And, and if we're not there, uh, then it, it doesn't happen. So I, I'll close on that note. Thank you all so much. For